Welcome back everybody to another Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast. It's just me today, no Tim, because I'm just back off the Ducati Diavel V4 launch in Abu Dhabi. And so given what I've learned on that trip, I thought I'd do a Q&A. So we've got questions from the private Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast Facebook group. I'll prioritize those first and then we'll move on to some questions that were submitted through YouTube. So I'm just going to, you know cut straight to the chase and get stuck in. So first up, Jim Parsons asks, it's an amazing looking bike, but are they still saying the Diavel is a cruiser? Because it certainly doesn't look or looks like it'll ride like one. No, it's a good question. And they did kind of confront that head on at the beginning of the technical presentation and press briefing on the first night. So they talked about how they've sold, I think 45,000 units in the first two generations of the V-twin powered Diavels. And uh, they talked about the origins and what they were thinking about when they designed the first iteration. And one of the ways they described it was like they wanted to create a mega monster, you know, a Ducati monster, but on steroids. And they said it's a unique proposition. It's really hard to pigeonhole the bike or fit it into any one category. They mentioned three things. So they said they wanted it to be part superbike with their sort of knowledge about how to make the bike handle and the electronics and the performance and the hardware. Secondly, they mentioned Super Naked, so stuff like the Street Fighter, and I suppose, yeah, it's never going to feel quite like a, or look quite like a sports bike, but it does have a little bit of that Street Fighter influence. Certainly now with the V4, the front end of the bike kind of looks a bit Super Naked-y, but also, yeah, it does have some cruiser influence. I would wholeheartedly agree that it's not a thoroughbred cruiser, it's not that talky delivery. It's not the sort of weighty, touring appropriate kind of setup. It really is a, a bit of a mix, but you've got to say it's got a long wheelbase, a massive rear wheel, and the riding position, certainly for the X Diavel anyway, is, uh, you know, feet forward, wide bars, a big tractor style saddle that sits fairly low. With this generation and um, the way that it's moved towards the V4, I'd say it's the least cruisery of them all, certainly in the way it rides, but it still is like a mega comfortable riding position. And you can see why somebody from a, you know, let's say they're from a cruiser background, but they want something more performance orientated and more thrilling to ride, then it fits the bill perfectly. You'll still find it comfortable. It's low, it's easy to get on with. It's very stable. I'd also say it's reasonably comfortable in the suspension. I mean, it's on the firm side, it's sporty, but it wouldn't be as firm as a Street Fighter or a Panigale. But equally, if you're from the kind of sports bike background and you want something more comfortable, maybe, you know, you can't physically fit or you don't find it comfortable to ride a sports bike or even a naked, you know, your bum's still fairly far up on a street fighter and you do feel a little bit over the front, then this will, again, fit the bill. It has ridiculous levels of performance and yet it's super comfortable. I mean, you can take a pillion as well. It's got a decent sized seat for the passenger. And so, yeah, I agree with what Ducati is saying. It is a unique proposition, although, Obviously, my reviews and stuff, it's hard not to compare it to Rocket 3s and maybe some of the more performance orientated Harleys. And I said that for anyone who's just listening on audio with some air quotes. You know, some Harleys will get upside down forks and twin discs. I still wouldn't say they're sporty, but they're, you know, trying to push towards that side. So there will naturally be comparisons with those bikes, but it's because it's weird. It's, it is a weird mix. And so what else are you going to compare it to? I suppose you always want to try and anchor bikes to, you know, something that people already know to give it a little bit of context and um, maybe help them understand what it's about. But yeah, it definitely is a mix, but a glorious mix at that. Like I say, very fast and very comfortable. Now, next we've got Chris J. Kirkham from the Facebook group. And he asks, beside the traditional red color scheme, what others will they be offering? Unfortunately, we've just got two. So you've got Ducati Red and then, oh, I think it's called something like Thrilling Black, which does sound like a little bit of a uh, juxtaposition. Let me have a look. Do I mean juxtaposition? Maybe Oxymoron is what I'm looking for there. Yeah, Thrilling Black. Um, look, it was kind of handy on the press ride because all of the journalists and 
social media type people were riding the red bikes, whereas the ride leaders, the Ducati sort of um, ex-racer, ridiculously fast guides, uh, were on the black bikes. So they used that as a really good way to identify who's who, and you could easily know who to speak to if you wanted to ask questions about the bike or the ride. Um, I would admit, though, I'd like to see something else in this lineup. I mean, they do generally refresh their bikes every year or so with a new color scheme. Uh, but maybe at launch, I'd have liked to have seen there's like a, is it called Grey Nero on the Street Fighter at the moment? I think that looks pretty good. And there's also a Matt Khaki. I don't know if that's the Street Fighter V2 or something, uh, but like a khaki green kind of color that would suit this bike quite nicely as well. Uh, but maybe they're keeping it simple, and then when other versions and iterations, maybe an S model or something come out, they might differentiate them with something a bit more spicy. For me, I get why people like a blacked out stealthy cruiser. So if you're into that kind of thing, uh, then yeah, it's, it sort of works, but it doesn't look quite as premium and exciting as that Ducati Red. And so for me, that'd be my pick. And also when you're doing YouTube and stuff and taking photos for Instagram while we're on the trip, obviously you want the bike that's gonna stand out the most. So uh, I did all of my shooting with that bike. Chris J. Cookham also asks, what price will it be offered at? So it's £23,595, which it's a big hike. I think the previous gen, let me just double check this as well, launched at something like just under seven grand in, tw uh, 17 grand rather in 2019. Yeah, it was 16,795 pounds. So this is nearly, you know, six and a half, seven grand um, more premium, they would say. I would say more expensive, but that's not usually what the manufacturers say. Expensive implies that it's more money than it's worth. Uh, you can see there are a lot of advancements, but it is a, a much higher starting price point. Some of that's going to be the cost of getting parts and all of the inflation that we're experiencing at the moment. But still, I think even without that, you'd be looking at a fairly significant step up. As for how that compares to equivalent stuff on the market, well, uh, the Rocket 3 is an obvious example. It's a similar bike in terms of the quality of the componentry. It's got that big inline triple that makes similar power and quite a bit more torque. And uh, it is quite a lot heavier, so I wouldn't say it's equivalent on performance. But if you're looking for a bike that has that, you know, real status kind of muscle bike image and uh, maybe the sort of premium level of finish and the top-notch components, then, yeah, it's a decent comparison. And that starts, I believe, for the R model at something like 22 and a half grand. And again, that's crept up over the past few years. If you're looking at something like a Harley Fat Bob, uh, I mentioned the more specced out Harleys uh, at the beginning of this video. That comes in now at 18995 so um, four and a half grand less in terms of the price but you're getting a bike there that's very very heavy it's like up over 300 kilograms if i remember correctly it doesn't get any tech it's very simple in terms of electronics so you don't get all the riding modes and the power modes and wheelie control and launch control and all that sort of stuff and uh, the engine really focuses on low down grunty torque. It makes most of its torque, I think, at two or 3,000 RPM. I wouldn't say it's comparable. I think it's easy to say that you're getting a lot more performance for four grand with the Diavel V4. Andrew Wilson on Facebook asks, what's the cost of servicing? Basic oil and filter service versus a major filter. Also, what mileages are the services required at? Uh, valve clearances, uh, manual adjustment or hydraulic lifter or bucket and shim setup? Good questions. They didn't get into that level of detail in the presentation. So I don't have those numbers to hand. I think they try and focus on the the most exciting sides of the bike and really get people to take away what it's like to ride. But I think those are fair questions. Um, perhaps if you call your local dealer, they'll give them to you. But I had a quick Google and I couldn't find them right now. I think the, the thing they're pushing with this bike on the service in front is that it's got the V4 Gran Turismo engine. So whereas the Street Fighter and Panigale get the regular V4, which revs up quite a bit higher, it has the Desmo valves that are so typical of um, Ducati bikes and they allow it to rev highly. You know, this GT version of the engine, it's more focused on mid-range and torquiness. It tops out at like 10 or 11,000 RPM, so it doesn't really uh, need that tech. And so it's got regular spring actuated valves 
And that means that the service intervals, I believe for the valve adjustments are like 60,000 kilometers. So it's the same engine as the Multistrada V4 and the Multi V4 Rally. That's super impressive. I don't think there's any other bike on the market with such long valve servicing intervals. As for the rest of the servicing, I mean, I probably would Im imagine most people are gonna take it in for an annual service uh, regardless with a bike of that value. If they can afford it, then you'd assume that they can afford to get it serviced on the regular. Also from Andrew Wilson on Facebook, we've got the question, keen to know what electronics are on board too. The usual TFT screen stuff, modes and safety bits and bobs. So four riding modes, uh, sport, touring, urban, and wet or rain. I can't remember which one it's called. Uh, each of those has varying levels of wheelie control, traction control, and ABS, which are uh, lean sensitive owing to a uh, inertial measurement unit. And there's two different levels of power. So you get the full 168 horsepower at 10,750 RPM. So you get the full uh, power delivery and the most lively throttle with the sport and touring modes, of course. And uh, yeah, the sport mode gives you a bit less uh, wheelie control and stuff like that, but really lively on the throttle. Touring's really good on twisty roads as well. And, and those are the two modes we switch between. It's almost like when you're just starting out and uh, the first run down this incredible mountain hill that we do, uh, maybe you just stick it in touring while you're letting the tires warm up and just kind of getting into the swing of things, but sport really does offer the full thrills and it's an absolutely rapid bike. The urban and wet modes, I think, limit it to 115 horsepower. Now, I rode the 1260 X Diavel, I think it was like a 2020 or 2019 model, about a week before I went out on this trip. So I've got a reasonable idea of how they compare in many areas. And one thing I did notice was it had a much smaller TFT display, still perfectly good. I quite like the design of the cockpit on that bike, but it is a step up in terms of the size of it on the Diavel V4. And it does make it nice and easy to read at a glance. So even in the very sunny conditions that we experienced out in uh, the UAE, it was perfectly easy to read. I really like white text on a black background and I like the fact that it defaulted to that. It also has some really punchy bright shift lights at the top. And then yeah, cruise control, launch control, uh, Bluetooth connectivity so you can do calls and music and turn-by-turn -turn nav. Keyless on the filler cap as well. I think there are heated grips in the accessories catalog. And I think that's about it. I mean, it's basically the works. There's nothing that you would have to do without basically. Even the lighting is super impressive. That's one of my favorite features. So the big uh, LED tail light that lights up very brightly when you brake and it has an emergency brake feature. Uh, where it flashes when you're hard on the brakes and also scrolling LED indicators as well. I think those are a standard. So loads of goodies and uh, tech wise, it's really impressive. Also, Andrew Wilson asks, what goody goody yum yums are <laughs> Ducati making for this beast? I do have the full list of accessories in my email courtesy of the Ducati PR team. Obviously, you've got a lot of visual stuff like carbon heat guards and fuel tank covers and headlight shrouds and the mug guards. Uh, we had the opportunity to look at a an accessory dirt bike in the foyer of the hotel. We didn't get to ride one, but I had most of them on. And I think there were little things like the carbon front mug guard did actually look really good. So I think I can see how they'd be a little bit tempting, although front carbon mug guard. 320 quid, 400 for the rear. I mean, clearly they weren't gonna be cheap. Uh, there are some bar end mirrors as well, which give it quite a nice look. Lots of touring stuff, so tank bags and uh, soft luggage and racks, and there's a premium comfortable rider seat, same for the passenger, and a little backrest as well. There are things like um, bar end weights and also little, you know, the oil filler cap and stuff like that, that you can get in a sort of more premium looking machined version. And there's TPMS and an alarm, but the, the big ones that stand out to me are the super expensive ones. So uh, the dry clutch kit, which I, I, I really don't know if it's at all worth £3,204.82p, uh, but it did look cool. They had that out on display. And then also the exhaust system. So it sounds pretty good, this bike, but I would say it kind of needs a bit more bark at the exhaust. I mean, you get plenty of noise from that airbox when you do get on the throttle. And uh, there's enough from that distinctive quad exit 
stock exhaust. Um, again, when you're really hard on the gas, but just kind of cruising around it, it'd be nice if it just had a bit more base to it, you know, a bit more throatiness. Uh, and so perhaps the racing exhaust would do the trick. It looks absolutely awesome. It's um, instead of the four exits being in a square shape, they called it like a rocket launcher inspiration for the stock exhaust. This Akropovich um, accessory exhaust has them in a line. So four kind of lengthways along the bottom. And I think it looks way better in my opinion, uh, but it is a racing exhaust. So it's not approved for road use. So I don't know whether that will affect people's decision to buy it or not. Maybe they'll risk it, uh, but 5,037 pounds and 12 pence. So pretty punchy. You've got to have fitting on top of that probably if you're going to get it done at the dealer. And there are three accessory packages. So Sport, which is going to give you some of the more um, performance orientated bits. Uh, Sport is 1300 quid. Style is about 1200 quid. That's going to give you the more visual pieces. And then the Touring accessories package, uh, 1500 quid. So that's probably going to save you a bit if you're going to get all the luggage and stuff. But yeah, they're, they're at the top end in terms of price. But that was to be expected. Now, thanks very much to everybody for their questions through the Facebook group. If you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening on your favorite podcast player and you, uh, you know, you've not uh, ventured over to Facebook, it's a private Facebook group, but we pretty much just accept everybody. It's just so we can keep it, you know, keep it to the creme de la creme of listeners and boot anyone out for spamming. But search for the Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast over on Facebook and it should pop up and please do join in. Uh, but now we'll get stuck into the YouTube questions and I'll start with LBNY Rider. He says, how good is the wind protection and would it be a good tourer? Now I need to just look back at that accessories list and see if there's any mention of a, a windscreen. So yes, touring windshield kit, £251.86. Uh, so relatively affordable compared to the rest of the stuff on there. Um, so maybe that would help, but I would say in standard form, it's really just like riding a naked bike. Perhaps you're shielded by the size of the tank and the way that you're sat a little bit lower behind it because of the riding position, but generally it's just full wind blast as you'd expect. And it's a very quick bike. So uh, you certainly get plenty of opportunity to experience some wind in your face. As for whether it'd be a good tourer, I just don't know if it'd be my choice. I think if you want to put the luggage on it so you can go away for a night or two, then yeah, there's the soft luggage options and also a magnetic tank bag. So between the two of those, you've got enough to pack a change of clothes or something like that. And if you were solo, you could fit a, a tail pack or a duffel bag on the back. But oh, I don't know. It's not excellent on fuel either. It does have this... Um, extended rear cylinder deactivation which they first announced i think on the multi v4 rally and basically it just runs on the front two cylinders when it's under 4000 rpm and you've got like a steady throttle so it, it is a little bit better on fuel than stuff like the street fighter and the panigale because when you're just cruising along at a steady speed it's just going to run on those front two obviously it's to help keep the saddle cool as well with the rear cylinder bank switched off really impressively done there's no step there's no kind of kick in power like you've heard about perhaps with something like honda's vtec system on the old vfrs super super smooth barely noticeable you can hear a little bit of a difference in the exhaust note um, so yeah, that has helped, but I wouldn't say it's got a massive fuel range. I wouldn't say it's particularly like a grunty engine. The old 1260 is a bit more torquey. This is a bit more performance and um, sort of like naked bike, sports naked bike feeling. But yeah, you could probably just get away with it if you buy it as a, a, a luxury item that looks amazing in the garage. It's a real kind of head turner statement bike. It's something that you can thoroughly enjoy riding on twisties as well. And it is very comfortable, at least for the shortish spells that we did. I mean, we were blasting up and down this sort of um, Pikes Peak type road. It was a twisty mountain road. They closed it off and we just got a chance to hammer up and down it. And you were really, you know, able to push the bike. No speed limits, no traffic. So you could just um, thoroughly enjoy it. But we didn't do that kind of like two hours in the saddle um, just to see how comfy it is on the motorway. Uh, we didn't really get a chance. So uh, I'm, I'll do some of that kind of testing when we get one in the UK and do a bit more of a, uh, you know, a few more long rides on it. But as it stands, I think personally, I'd be looking at the Multistrada V4. If you want something that does offer the same level of excitement and performance, it's a little bit lighter, which surprised me because it's so much bigger in terms of stature. But 
yeah, the Moti V4 maybe is, you know, I'd say it's probably reasonably quick. It's not as low slung, but it's comparable in terms of performance. It gets the same uh, V4 Gran Turismo engine, but it's got the windscreen. It's got all the touring accessories. You've got handguards. You've got the option to get full luggage. Uh, there's more space on the back there. I think you've got the option of things like heated seats as well. And I think it'll be better on um, fuel range. And so certainly the new rally version anyway, with the much bigger tank, nearly 30 litres or it might actually be 30 litres. Uh, that's going to be a way better shout for touring, in my opinion, than uh, the Diavel V4. But it is comfy. Uh, also from YouTube, Chris Agostino. How easy is it to replace that hideous exhaust? Like I say, you've got the option of the racing one if you're willing to risk it. Uh, I'm pretty sure it isn't road legal. And personally, I think it looks fantastic. I'm assuming that third parties, you know, will offer something on the market pretty soon. But otherwise, yeah, you're stuck with that Akropovich exhaust and that is five grand. So how easy is it to replace? Well, that really depends how much money you've got in your bank. Uh, Raul MS also on YouTube. My main concern about the Diavel V4 is about its weight and how it affects the bike's handling characteristics. And I don't know if you mean that as a kind of good thing or bad thing. This new Diavel V4, they got rid of the trellis frame and they looked at how they could save weight all over the bike. And so it comes in at 13 kilograms less than the 1260S that sort of was um, the bike it is kind of replaced. It's 211 kilograms dry, which I think is super impressive for a bike of that length and girth. And so yeah, 211 is, I would say, really good and it handles exceptionally well. The ground clearance is nowhere near as compromised as any other cruiser that I've ridden and even the guys who are ex-racers on the British sort of um, press trip weren't really grumbling about that and quite often on the um, the cruiser launches I've been on, stuff like the Harley uh, Nightster last year, you know, those guys who can really corner on a bike uh, were grinding down the pegs non-stop but I didn't hear as much of that. Personally, I didn't find it a problem as well. So, you know, it's light, it handles well, it's got great suspension and the braking is super impressive with those big 330mm discs as well and the Brembo style lemmas. So uh, for me, it handles way, way, way better than it looks like it ought to. Um, but perhaps, yeah, you're coming at it from a Street Fighter V4 perspective. And for comparison, let's have a little quick look. Yeah, the standard version, the standard Street Fighter V4 is 180 kilograms in terms of dry weight. And then the V4S, despite the fact that it gets the electronically adjustable um, Olin suspension, which tends to be a bit heavier, is actually 178 kilograms dry, probably because of the uh, Marquezini forged aluminium wheels, which do shed a lot of weight and also really help with handling. Um, so yeah, that's 30 to 30, well, 33 kilograms more for the Diavel V4. And so naturally it's never going to handle, you know, the same as the Street Fighter V4 or as, as well as that. It's not just the weight, but also the way it's set up, the geometry of the bike, the riding position, all those things would make the Street Fighter V4 more engaging and sporty to ride on, uh, you know, that sort of twisty road. But, you know, this is the whole thing that they were talking about at the beginning when I was talking about the three bikes that they've, or genre of bike that they've taken inspiration for. You know, they do have a sports bike. If you want out and out maximum performance, they have a naked if you want that kind of performance, but perhaps a little bit more sat up and a little bit more road biased. But if you really want the comfort and uh, you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of performance, um, then there's the Diavel V4. And really, like I say, I think if you're looking for a cruiser position bike or something as close as possible to that, I don't know. I'm thinking now before I make this statement, but I don't think you're going to find a better handling bike with that riding position. So I think it's about as good as it can be. And everything with motorcycles is a trade-off. You know, if you want um, better spec components, you're going to have to trade off price. If you want something cheaper, you know, it's not going to be quite as good or as fast. If you want more fuel range, you know, it's going to make the bike heavier and more top heavy. There are always trade-offs to every improvement. And so naturally it's never going to be as good as the other bikes in terms of handling, you know, that, that other style of bike. But for what it is, it's really impressive. Terrible username, am I right? Also asked on YouTube, how's the handling? So I think I've covered that one off. Is very, very good. And then next up, we've got Mike. So why and what is its value proposition? Is it the Lux? The Street Fighter exists if you want performance. The Multi V4S has all the power and way more comfortable. The ergonomics on the Diavel will be not as good for uh, touring and not as good for the long haul. It's neither more comfy nor better performing than any other V4s in Ducati's lineup. Again, I think I've roughly answered that. You know, no one's saying you have to buy it. 
Um, and there are the other options there, but one of the things has to be the looks. I mean, it really is striking with that big single-sided swing arm. It's not quite as good looking, in my opinion, as the previous gen, like the XD Avil that I mentioned I rode the other day, just has a bit more uh, finesse to it, perhaps. And there's a bit more in terms of plastic covers and stuff like that on the new V4. But still, if you just took it on its own and parked outside a, a biker spot or something like that, or a calf, people are going to be stopping and looking at that bike and wanting to talk about it. And for some people, that is... A big part of owning something, something really special that's got proper pride of ownership. And I think, for me anyway, I wouldn't want to ride the Panigale on the road. I've tried it and it's not a bike that personally, I know people love sports bikes, totally get it. But for me personally, I just don't enjoy being in that riding position all day on the road. So I'd be much more likely to steer towards the Street Fighter or the Diablo V4. And quite honestly, having ridden it, I'd be very, very tempted. I think if you're genuinely thinking about pulling the trigger on one just go and demo ride it because maybe it'll make more sense it's going to be lower slung than the the multistrada so it's going to probably handle a bit more aggressively you might feel like you can hang off it a bit more and so i think that's where it sits as the kind of um visually it's very compelling there's some really interesting design features and it's sort of something that just goes fast but does it in comfort it kind of looks cool and it's just for having fun. It's a fun bike. I don't know if we need to worry too much about where it kind of slots in. I would just say go ride one and see what you think then, because it, it doesn't fit a category. It doesn't make sense. They know it doesn't make sense, but it's all for me about the, the riding position and how easy it feels and how you don't have to compromise on, on comfort. And it's easily fast enough for road riding, like massively fast enough for road riding. I'm so glad that we got to ride it on a closed road with no speed limit because you can see just how fast it is. And the only other way that they could have done that is put us on a track day for the launch, which I think would have made it feel too serious. It's not a track bike. People have been, well, why are you launching it on the track? It doesn't make sense. It's not a track bike. Get one of the other two. Um, but it did allow us to see just how fast it is. And I reckon probably some people would be pretty quick around the track on it. Dr. Gunnett says, is it noticeably better or worse or the same compared to the 1260? Now I've got a direct comparison video. I also got this question from Two Wheel Weekend Viking and Yash Chavda. So they basically say, um, you know, how's the 1260? Um, and then also Yash says, uh, what about the XD Avil? How does that compare? So we'll start with the XD Avil, which is the one that I borrowed from Superbike Factory and that has the forward foot peg position. So if you're looking for something with forward pegs, Absolutely no idea why anyone would prefer that because personally, I just like the pegs to be beneath me when you're on a bike that's as capable as that in terms of sporting ability, then yeah, I'd always want the, the pegs down there. But if you do want that riding position, which is more cruiser style, then the XD Avil is still a great choice and it's still in the lineup. The 1260s with which that XD Avil shares the big V-twin engine, I guess having experienced it recently, that engine does feel more similar to what you'd expect for a cruiser style bike. And it does offer a bit more low down grunt, that sort of distinctive uh, Ducati, Revy, L-Twin kind of sound. And yeah, I think it's just got more of that grunty feel and it doesn't feel like it wants to rev up in the same way that the V4 does. I mean, it just feels like a street fighter, but longer and more comfy. So it has more of that sporty side to it. It feels like it really wants to go. And I think that's really the, the key difference for me. Uh, well, three key differences. I talk about these in the, the comparison video, but look, I'll give you the short version. The engine, more grunty in the 1260, more revvy in the V4. The weight loss is very noticeable. There's no big difference in terms of quality of the componentry and stuff like that. But, you know, 13 kilograms is quite a lot to shed. And then also the price, you know, the 1260 is always going to be able to pick that up for much less. Be that new stock that's still in the dealer, perhaps, or, you know, the used one I tried was pretty impressive for the money. Whereas the V4 at 23 and a half grand is going to price a few people out, at least for now anyway. So uh, those are the big Big, big differences. If I had an X Diavel or a Diavel 1260S and I still really liked riding it, then I'm not sure. I, I, I'd, I'd demo the Diavel V4 if, you, if you're slightly tempted because it is a different thing with the engine. That's that's the key differentiator, the feel of it. But I wouldn't say it's an, a night and day improvement. It's just a big improvement in weight, a completely different engine character. Um, and I can still see how the 1260 appeals and it's still got a lot of, um, you know, it's still got a lot of performance and uh, it's still striking visually and it hasn't really 
in my opinion anyway, aged too much. So uh, I can still see how that's a, a good purchase. And I'd be very tempted. I loved that XD Avil I tried out, actually. I thought I was... Um, very impressed with it. Rego 200, also on YouTube. Why can't Ducati build beautiful bikes without a high amount of plastic covers anymore? Triumph can still do it. And also, why does the, this is the same uh, from Rego 200 as well. Why does the V4 cost about 10 grand more than the V2? Even though the V4 isn't built in much more bikes from Ducati and can probably be built cheaper than the V2. I'm not, I don't know if I've quite nailed the reading of that, but I get what you're saying. I don't know about 10K, in the UK, I don't think it's quite as big a difference, but maybe in the US it is. I agree that there are some, like on the, I'm pretty sure on the rear cylinder bank, I'm going to have to look back at the footage, but I think there's like a fake cylinder head uh, because the, the rear cylinder bank sits more under the seat. And so they've styled it up with a little plasticky looking cover on the side. So I understand how it's not quite as aesthetic as the 1260, which has these beautiful machined uh, engine cases that really make it a standout feature. You know, it's not a good looking engine, I would say, or at least not in the same way. And so I get what you're saying. Something like the Rocket 3 looks almost perfect, absolutely everywhere. But I would say, I think I mentioned this as well, in its own right, if you look at that Diavel V4, the, the finish on it is pretty incredible and it is a great looking bike. Uh, the, the back end specifically with that single sided swing arm, the diamond cut wheels, the tail light, which is, you know, unusual, but also really functional and kind of makes it super distinctive. I mean, if you see one of those out on the road riding behind it, you're going to know immediately what it is. And then, yeah, I think the, the back end of it all, all looks pretty good. I like the headlight at the front. It's just maybe that sort of middle section where the engine is and there's a few little covers on there that busy it up that isn't quite as good. I don't know what that is. I mean, presumably they switched over to the V4 for the performance it offers. And also maybe there's some economies of scale that mean that if all the bikes are on the V4 platform, then it's more efficient for them, perhaps. So yeah, I think a lot of those visual issues stem from the V4, which isn't quite as aesthetic. As for why it costs more, I mean, like I say, inflation is crazy at the moment, so that's probably a factor. But naturally, new bikes, they'll, they'll jack the price up a bit. And you have to look at that bike and think, it is impressive what you get in. The engine is impressive. The technology package is impressive. Maybe there'll be a V4S later with slightly better suspension, but the suspension that's on it is perfectly up to the job. Pretty much best in category braking setup. And so um, I can kind of understand why the price is high because it doesn't really feel like they've compromised anywhere apart from maybe visually on the engine front. And also potentially a V4 with more cylinders and more moving parts. Perhaps it's more expensive to make than the, the 1260, which was fairly long-standing and maybe a bit less research having to go into that. Now, Spetnaz XT, uh, he says it's a V4 engine. So is it aggressive like the Panigale or relaxed? Now, I wouldn't say it's, you know, that's very um, black and white. It's not as aggressive as the Panigale because it's that GT version. So it's more chilled out, but it's not a relaxed and lazy cruiser style engine. It still is a V4. It still likes to rev. And so it's somewhere in the middle of the two. It's not as highly strung. You don't have to rev it as hard as the other bikes. Um, but I wouldn't say it's that lazy cruiser style, relaxed twin, something like a, a Harley that revs really slowly, you know, lots of inertia, all the torques low down. It, it doesn't feel like that. But neither did the, the previous Gen 1260. That also felt quite lively to me, certainly for a cruiser. So uh, yeah, somewhere in the middle, a, a slightly more tame, Panigale or Street Fighter is how it feels. Bob Z or possibly Bob Z, depending on where he hails from, says, how does it compare to the Rocket 3? Similar on price, similar in terms of the luxuriousness, similar in terms of the, you know, head turning capacities of those bikes, I would say. But yeah, the Rocket 3 has a lot more torque, but is way heavier. If you've ever watched a drag race between the uh, the new Rocket 3 and then the, the 1260. There's one on Bike World. Go and check it out. But the, the Rocket 3 can't keep up because of that massive weight difference. I think it's just over 300 kilograms compared to 211 drive for this. So you're talking like a, a big passenger, basically, is the difference. And you're never going to make up for that with the with the torque. And they've got pretty similar peak power figures. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Diavel is the quicker of the two bikes. And it's much more lively through corners. And it's a much more sporty ride. Uh, the Rocket feels like a big bike and it is impressive for the size of it. It does handle incredibly well and uh, it's super, super fast. I remember my wife being on the back when we had a press bike and just nailing it out of a, a junction to get away up to speed and it wheelied. And I just thought, how can a 300 kilogram bike <laughs> that's this long, you know, start popping the front wheel up? Uh, so it's a mega impressive bike, but 
the weight difference is, is just huge. And what I would say is that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I mean, uh, sometimes there's something to be said if you want to cruise more and tour more. I mean, the, the Rocket 3 doesn't have a great deal of, of touring accessories either. And if you wanted a, a bike from the Triumph lineup, I'd still argue something like the Tiger 1200 would be a better tool for the job. Uh, but yeah, if you did want to do distance on it, that weightiness can give it a sort of um, planted, substantial feel, which irons out the road a bit more. And so if you demo that, you might think, well, this is the one that has that massive road presence. And, and that might be what excites you about it. It really just depends on what you want out of the two bikes. But yeah, they're very, they're very different. One more sporty, one more just like massive muscle bike type thing, um, but they'll suit slightly different tastes. Will Cisco says the Diablo V4 and Multistrada V4 have the same GT engine, but which of the two is the fastest? Oh, difficult question. The Multistrada V4 is, I think, um, about 10 kilos lighter. So potentially in a straight line, it might be the quicker, although the, the Diablo has that massive 240 section rear tire. So it's going to get a bit more grip and it's very long as well. So it might be less likely to wheelie. And then depends on what tires you've got on the multi. And it is quite a skinny rear on that. Um, so tough to call. Through corners as well, even with that weight disadvantage, just for its low center of mass, I'll probably imagine, you know, around a track or something, probably the Diavel, but it feels like a piece of consumer research that somebody needs to do. Probably not me, but I'd love to see that on something like Bike World where they, they've got the riders and the, and the sort of uh, ability to hire out tracks and stuff. I think that'd be awesome. Next from Biker Believer, what's the MPG? How are the throttle sensitivity and comfort levels on longer rides if possible? So yeah, we didn't do much in terms of um, longer rides, but uh, it's great for like short blasts and it definitely feels more comfy than a, a more aggressive bike. Uh, throttle sensitivity. I thought the throttle was really nicely set up. I didn't find it choppy when you're just cracking the throttle mid-turn, which is what kind of bugs me on some bikes. Things like the Z900 from Kawasaki has like a, a bit of a lurch and feels a bit um, disconcerting when you're trying to keep the bike stable and settled. This bike felt really good. And like I say, with the four modes, you've got two levels of actual power delivery and then varying levels of sort of throttle sensitivity. So for whatever situation you're riding in, you should be able to find something appropriate. As for the miles per gallon, I think it's something like 6.4 liters per 100 kilometers, which is 36 US miles per gallon or 44 um, UK miles per gallon. Not particularly impressive, but like I say, quite a lot better than uh, the, the Panigale and Street Fighter, I think they're like seven and a half or something, seven and a half liters per hundred kilometers. Uh, it's not, not really a bike that you want to do, you know, economical commuting on and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, 20 liter tank should be enough for a decent Sunday ride with one stop or so. Turtle the Poodle ass, is it fun? Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot of fun actually and I haven't talked too much about just how quick it is when you just completely nail it like stick it in sport mode uh, up this um, mountain road we had lots of turns but towards the top there were a couple of straights and then slowing back down into a uh, hairpin turn and you know just fully gassing it in sport mode and it has such a crisp quick shifter as well as you'd expect if it's derived somewhat from the the Panigalian Street Fighter and uh, yeah, it just really has a lot of top end sort of aggressiveness and things start moving very quickly. It's not sports bike quick, but it is enough to give you a proper thrill slash slightly scare you. And then hard on the brakes, excellent brakes, back down the quick shift. It sounds perfect. I'm going to put a video on one of my other channels called Moto Exhaust. We sometimes just put exhaust sound, like entire videos of it. Have a listen to that if you want to hear what it, it sounds like. But it's it's lovely on the on the quick shifter coming down. And then great through the corners and then, you know, straight back on it. It's such a fun bike. doesn't take itself too seriously. And then the, the, the sort of curb appeal as well adds to the fun of, of riding it. David Kang, does Ducati uh, plan to have an S version with the um, Olins and other goodies? So for anyone who's not aware, things like the Multistrada, the Street Fighter, the Panigale are all pretty much uh, available in an S version, which gives you, I mean, the big upgrade is... Olin semi-active electronic suspension. So it's gonna uh, respond to the road conditions and also the riding style. So if you're going aggressively versus if you're sort of cruising along and it will vary the amount of damping in real time. And also on the on the uh, Multistradas, it does stuff like automatic preload. So it knows how much preload to give it to keep the bike level. So your passenger can just jump on and it will set it up perfectly. So it doesn't affect the handling. Uh, they didn't mention any uh, plans to have an S version, to be honest. 
But it seems like that must be coming. I mean, uh, semi-active suspension for a bike that is a bike of two halves, the sort of cruising style, but also the sporting ability, you know, it's perfect for that. Whereas a, a Panigale, you know, if you look at b bikes that race on the track, they're, they're going to actually go for um, mechanically adjustable suspension. Uh, with this bike, I, I think it really would suit it. Assuming as well, that's going to push the price up by another few grand. Uh, so it really would be top draw premium. Um, but yeah, they didn't mention it, but it's, it just makes sense, doesn't it? So I'd expect that. Um, they rarely ever talk, actually, just as an aside. If you go to a bike launch, be that dial into a Zoom call and, and the bike's embargoed and you get to learn all about it. Or if you go to the launch and they're doing Q&A or, um, you know, like the press briefings, they'll never, not just Ducati, any manufacturer will never want to talk about what bike it might evolve into or whether the engine's going to be used uh, in another style of bike or whatever. So... If you find that frustrating, if you comment asking your favorite YouTube channel or publication, uh, will this lead to this and can, can you ask? They will always straight bat it and say, we're here today to talk about this bike and, and not specul about, speculate about other future bikes. And you can understand it. I mean, they've laid down a lot of money to get everybody out there and the focus is on that particular bike and they don't want to steal their own headlines by focusing on something else. But also anyone who's going to get down to a dealer and buy one of these, they don't want to say, oh, wait for another six months or 12 months for something else. They're going to want them to to buy the bike that they, they're, they're selling at the moment. And so, yeah, apologies, I can't give you a more enlightening answer, but that's just the way they always play it. Now, Douglas Gray says, uh, will there be a V4S version two? And also Abby Alex. So I think I've answered those two and that rounds off this Q&A. Good golly. It's much easier when Tim's here and we can just go back and forth. That is a lot of talking, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think of it, either on the... Um, Facebook group or the Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast um, YouTube channel in the comments here. If you enjoyed this, then I'll try and do them after future launches. We've got the Riding the Monster SP tomorrow and then out to Spain for the Street Triple. And then the week after, Tim's going out on a CF Moto launch where they get a chance to ride pretty much the entire lineup, which is super exciting. So yeah, if you like this kind of video, he can do one after that as well and uh, and we'll do more of it. Maybe we'll do it as a chat. Tim could ask me the questions and then I could just answer them and it would give me occasionally a little moment to catch my breath. But um, yeah, like I say, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know what you think of the bike down in the comments. If there's any questions I've missed as well, drop those down there and I'll try and dive in and answer them. Uh, but yeah, hit us up in your favorite podcast player and hopefully I'll see you in... Well, I won't see you. You'll hear me. Slash, if you're watching video, I'll see you in the next one.